supplement for um, diabetes management with a finger prick. And I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the impact of diabetes and the, the real big take home numbers are here at the bottom. There's uh, projections that are actually off the, the, the charts. Uh, most years come around, we find out that the projections were actually wrong. The expenditures as well, the impact in economic terms are actually on the rise too, and they usually exceed the models. Uh, the impact on the human side of the factor is, is improperly controlled diabetes really leads to some uh, nasty side effects, uh, typically amputations or heart attacks, other uh, issues that are really uh, debilitating eventually, the early untimely death as well. Um, give a little bit of a background on the uh, history of uh, the glucometer. It really starts with Clark in 1962, and when he did the uh, first uh, glucose oxidase antimetric uh, glucose sensor, uh, but they hit, um, translated to a uh, clinical device, the uh, YSI, that's actually still used in uh, hospitals uh, across the country and the world. And today, uh, the modern glucometer really owes uh, CAS in 1984 uh, the development of using a mediated reaction, using kerosene, uh, to increase uh, electron transfer. Uh, but basically, uh, what is this? Is an electrochemical signal where we apply a DC potential on a uh, enzymatic reaction. Uh, here we're using a uh, GDH mediated with a FDA cofactor and ferricyanide. Uh, and we're measuring a, a simple current elucidation from the uh, reaction. And typically what you would do then is make these nice little Clark error grids where you go against, say, your YSI reading and pick your unknown and cross it. And you're really shooting for this Y equals MX plus B, uh, this line here, the A line. Uh, the rest of the regions are actually even used clinically to uh, tell patients some of the problems with uh, glucometers. And in your 100-page manual, you'll usually find a, a photograph of this uh, chart. But there's some actual issues with this. Uh, one of my colleagues at Mayo Clinic, uh, who's an endocrinologist, will tell his patients to do this two to ten times a day, uh, preferably on the ten side. Uh, and you'll actually have a better outcome uh, in your diabetes management, but it doesn't always actually happen. And some of the problems are when do you take the reading? Are you going to be a hyperglycemic or a hypoglycemic? Is it before a meal or after a meal? Uh, there's other issues for it. Uh, the pain is one of the least reported uh, side effects. Uh, there's only about seven publications out there on finger pricking pain. Yet if you talk to the patients, what my colleague does, it's the number one problem they have with it. Um, and the other issues are just uh, human factors, the cost of strips uh, to improperly taking the readings where someone may prick their finger, put the uh, blood drop into the sensor, put the sensor down because the phone or the doorbell rang and they walk away from it, coming back to take the reading later. So there's a lot of little complications in the very simple device. Um, so what we try to do is something a little bit different to get away from the, uh, the pain factor was to go into a non-invasive medium uh, tear fluid, and we quickly found out it's actually been researched since the 1930s. And uh, there's some uh, pros and cons to it, and part of it is, there, a lot of it is, is really, there's a lot of uh, less interference in the uh, tear fluid, and that was really encouraging to us. But the, cha the challenge is really to get down to these uh, ultra-low levels of uh, glucose in the tear fluid. So it wasn't going to be a simple uh, little problem. And uh, Baca put together this wonderful report. Uh, this data is actually on the bottom. I cut it. It's uh, by year, and it goes back to 1937. And they tried different methods of throwing tears from the uh, patients. And this is some of the challenges uh, we're actually in acquiring the tear fluid. A stress-induced uh, response, and your eye is actually uh, mediated with a higher glucose reading. So. Uh, one group was taking an onion and putting it on a person's face to get more tear fluid out of their eye. It actually caused a faulty reading and the glucose was off the scale. Uh, a rubbing of the eye is actually a bad event. So there are people who put a glass capillary onto the eye and hold it there for five minutes to acquire enough, uh, it's kind of scary, uh, enough tear fluid to uh, actually get a measurement. Uh, there are some people that have actually come up with uh, some pretty novel techniques that actually will get a, a small volume off the uh, tear uh, for, or off the eye. Uh, the problem is they have evaporation and, and so then they get a faulty reading. So there are a lot of challenges in, into working with tear fluid. Um, my favorite was the finger poke in the eye. Uh, there's actually some people that are doing some wonderful work in this world. Uh, Parvez is actually doing some work with a, a wearable uh, system that's electrochemically 
recording. Uh, this is not a functional device yet, wearable. Uh, he has to have leads coming off of it and he can actually record continuously. Uh, there's a, a ring around there that's actually a wireless antenna so he can send the data to the device. So the future is looking pretty good. Um, some of the current future, I guess, uh, failures were like Pelican Technologies where they tried to just make the Lancet not as painful. Um, it was an added cost, uh, about $200 for that instrument and $100 for the wheel and that company's out of business now. Uh, you're putting a bigger burden financially on the patient and it doesn't really go well with the patients. Um, but we decided to go after the tear fluid. Unlike a color change in contact or any of these other techniques, we decided to stick with electrochemical. Uh, to me, it's mostly that last line. Uh, it's all about the FDA. We wanted to translate the device to market, and the only way we're going to do that is if you did something that's already been done. It's kind of like the juxtaposition that you get between the FDA and the patent. Uh, the patent people, I want to tell them that I'm doing something completely new and novel. Then the FDA, I want to tell them I'm doing something like everybody else has always done before. So uh, it was a little bit of a juggling act there, too. But So our, our uh, proposed device that we were working on was uh, a little add-on uh, capture fluidic that goes on top of an uh, electrochemical sensor. Uh, what it allows for is a small um, volume of uh, tear fluid to be captured off the eye with just a simple touch to the uh, conjunctiva of the eye. And about nine seconds later, uh, we'll get an electrochemical reading that correlates, hopefully, with uh, uh, blood glucose. So we went to the books, and if you look at any good engineering design book that talks about FDA or device uh, technology transfer, they have these wonderful little figures that just tells you how to go and get rich. And uh, so we put one of these together, and uh, we really enjoyed our, our path on it. Um, our pilot data came from devices that I'll show you a lot of pictures of. Uh, these were made to work on the bench. They weren't really the final device. But we had to see if the, the technology was, uh, if it was feasible that we could actually measure something around the level of tear fluid. And uh, what we did is we made these little, uh, like, wells on top of the uh, the uh, device and uh, it has a little sampling area that will go down the channel and over the sensor and we'd be able to uh, record on a standard strip electrode uh, what the glucose concentration was. So we played around with uh, some SOLIDWORKS and made some two-part molds, eventually machining these out of uh, aluminum and uh, within about seven minutes or so we can actually produce one device so we were in high throughput and uh, after I think it was um, I think about a three day period we made enough devices to run a whole bunch of experiments. Basically what we're looking at is this electrochemical uh, generation of current here over time and we were uh, picking nine uh, seconds because of the uh, tightness of fit and the uh, responsivity uh, gradient there that kept a nice linear curve. So yeah, three days of fabrication in our high throughput mode uh, allowed us to make about 100 devices and it was a grueling three days but uh, we actually achieved something that was around the FDA's a desired target of 20% reproducibility. Um, and we also had a lower limit detection that was right around where tear fluid was. So we were very excited and uh, decided to move forward uh, down our nice little clinical pathway uh, to a preclinical study. And what we did is we went out and uh, acquired uh, venture capital funding for the project. So we could do a small animal study using white New Zealand rabbit. And uh, yeah, we're just going right down this pathway and thinking everything's wonderful. And uh, we started some um, uh, the technology started with a concern of are we damaging the eye and what we did is we touched the eye to the nasal and temporal region and we uh, do a lysamine dye uh, up here at the site of application to see if we have scratched the uh, eye at all and uh, using histogram densitometric methods we found out that we're really bad at putting that drop of dye on the eye we were scratching the heck out of the eye there but the device was actually causing no, no irritation uh, whatsoever we just finished our longitudinal study of over a year and we haven't really damaged too many eyes except where we put the dye. So uh, we're, we're trying to learn how to use dye better. Um, as far as correlation to blood glucose, we're a little bit frightened because when we got our initial Clark Air grid, uh, we quickly found out we had this uh, two populations of data. Uh, but what ended up happening, I, I can now say this, I was so lucky that uh, I had a device fail, an instrument fail on me, and I opened it up and I had one day left on the warranty. So I was really happy this work, this failed, so I could get that device repaired. Uh, but we also had another issue in manufacturing, but it was quickly fixed by um, taking our clear glue and adding a uh, oil-based paint to it so we could actually see where we were gluing because our, our manufacturing issue was 
we're closing off the channel on some devices. And other devices, we uh, covered up the electrodes, so we're getting very low turns. And we couldn't figure out what the problem was until we actually took this step. So that was a nice, quick little solution. So as we took that data off and started looking at our Clark Air Grid again, we started seeing something that we we're really hoping for. So um, this is coming from, I think, just one phase of uh, animal. Uh, the other question comes out of the, the continuous glucose monitor world. Uh, when they uh, put the pin in here and you're taking measurements, one of the issues is that that glucose signal is actually lagging behind the finger prick signal. And they have to get into some fancy algorithms and uh, make some corrections for that time delay. So we're curious as to what was our time lag. And uh, we actually took our readings and found out that we're actually under the window of using fancy math or anything there. So uh, we're very excited about that as well. And uh, one of the things that we're doing now is we're, we found out that this device is really neat and all, but it doesn't really work well when you're trying to do it to yourself or even to an animal. So we went into this massive round of playing with SolidWorks and trying to move most of the capture uh, to the distal end of the device. And then uh, through subsequent revisions, trying to make molds and make these uh, devices smaller so we don't use up as much material. Uh, version 3.0 was axed because it was going to be a $10,000 mold. I uh, did not like that, so we got to our next final design, version 4.0, and uh, we started this uh, ridging to kind of prevent the glue from seeping into uh, the channel or on the device. And uh, unfortunately, we never built version 4.0, the final one, because we forgot something that was really neat. Uh, we came up with a way of dimpling on the uh, mold, and it actually had better adhesion to the, the sensor. And so we got really excited about this one, but if you recognize the uh, thing on the top there, uh, we forgot to move it back to the distal end. So version uh, 4.2 is actually under construction right now in the lab, so hopefully we'll have this one out soon where we get all the parts right the first time through. I'd like to actually thank the team. This is actually half the team. I couldn't fit everybody on there and thank our sponsors and our partners. But uh, we have, uh, I think we have almost more people than rabbits right now, uh, which is growing too. I, I think there's a correlation there. But uh, I have a very good, strong uh, bunch of undergraduates, grad students, and uh, PhD students on the project. And I uh, have wonderful support from the Mayo Clinic and uh, ASU. And of course, Amano has been uh, very uh, useful on uh, their information with enzymes and uh, BioXL and their funding. So uh, I'd like to end the talk and just ask if there's any questions. Basically, if you had a type 1 diabetic that was really, really good about monitoring their diabetes, we have enough data to show that it's safe. Uh, but it's a good point that you mentioned about the version 4.2 and retesting. We're doing a material change out as well, so we, we, we're definitely going back to uh, preclinical because if we change the material and it has no test on an animal, we've got to do it. Thanks, sir. Other questions? Jeff, I have one. So is it using the, the same glucose oxidase based amphimetric uh, sensor? Um, sort of, yeah. Um, it, we're, we're using the same um, configuration, except we are using a glucose dehydrogenase uh, FAD cofactor. It's actually a little bit, um, I think we're about ready to publish this. Is, uh, it's a, I don't know, we just, we just published this one. Um, it's a, a little bit more reactive, about uh, almost an order of magnitude more reactive in activity uh, to glucose uh, oxidation. So we get a higher signal. Out of it. And we played around with the mediators too. And what are the volume of requirements that you have? Uh, well, what would, our idea would be going down below half a microliter. Uh, the tear fluid flow rate on the human eye, at least, is about 1.6 microliters per minute. So we usually have about that much on the eyeball. So, uh, yeah, we want to stay under that. Yeah. One last, one last question. Yeah. Um, have, you, have you actually done interviews to see if people would rather? something in their eye. <laughs> yeah, actually we started off by pricking the eye and they didn't like that. But, uh, uh, we're, uh, that was messy. Uh, we, we, uh, we're working on it with our business school, uh, W.P. Carey School of Business, and uh, they have done surveys and actually they did a market trend uh, penetration model 
based on contact lens use versus glassware. And actually, it was, it was kind of funny that the numbers actually converged. It was actually a great model to use. So uh, we think we should have pretty good uh, you know, market penetration there. Uh, one of the things I kind of glossed over is we're really just an add-on device, too. We can get onto any of the big fives uh, production line and just add on our, our uh, little uh, microfluid and can be ready for production. So. Very good question. Yeah. The idea is multiple levels from like invasive devices to devices that are outside. Level and how long does it take for the Oh, right. So on, on our device, it, it's just basically it's it's literally a touch like that. We don't even hold the uh, the device on the eye at all. Um, as far as what some people have done, there's there. I think the high end is a uh, five minute glass capillary uh, held by an ophthalmologist on the eyeball of a patient. And I, I've seen the study. It's a brilliant study, except that they have a lot of uh, irritation because. You're trying to hold this little thing steady and you end up rubbing the eye. Uh, you also get some of the lipids off of the eye and you get protein interference and other interferences that are really bad for electrochemistry. Great. I think uh, with that, we're going to thank Jeff and move on.